If you're looking to get beautiful, accurate colors in your videos, before you even begin playing with all the tools in DaVinci Resolve, there's one concept you need to get your head around, and that's color management. Get this right, and you'll transform your color grading workflow from a guessing game into a precise science. So what is color management? It sounds complicated, but the idea is simple. Imagine you have a friend who speaks Spanish, and they want to send a message to another friend who speaks French. If you just pass the message in Spanish directly to the French speaker, they won't understand it. Color management is like having a really smart translator. It takes the color language from your camera, and it translates it into the color language that your screen expects. When you look at a log image on your computer screen, it looks desaturated and flat. That's because the screen can't show everything the camera saw, and your job is to act as a translator so the image looks correct. Every camera and every display has its own way of seeing and showing colors. This is defined by two main things, which I'm going to explain as simply as I can. First, you have color space, or gamut. Think of this as the total number of crayons in a box. Some cameras can capture a huge box of crayons, and some screens can only show a smaller box. If I open up my scopes real quick, and I look at the CIE chromaticity scope, this big shape here represents all visible color. This triangle represents Rec. 709, which is the color space of this computer monitor. That means this is all the colors Rec. 709 can reproduce, which in comparison to that big shape is not very many. I'll add a second gamma overlay for REY Gamut 3, which is the color space that the footage was shot in. And you'll see it covers way more of the visible color range. The second part of this equation is the gamma or transfer function. This defines how light and dark the picture looks. Cameras often record in a log gamma to capture as much detail as possible in the shadows and highlights. The screens can't natively show all that information, so it looks flat and desaturated. Now, DaVinci Resolve has some great automatic ways to handle color you can access in your project settings, like DaVinci YRGB Color Managed or ACES. Personally, I like to have full control over my image. I don't like things happening under the hood where I can't see them. So in this video, I'm going to show you how to do it directly in your node tree. We're going to use an effect called a Color Space Transform, or CST. This effect is that translator we talked about. You put it on a node, and it lets you tell Resolve, my video speaks this color language, and I want to change it to that color language. Now I'm going to show you three different ways you can use a CST to get your color management set up correctly. And make sure you watch until the end, because I'm going to show you a special node I don't see many other people talking about. With the first method, you do all your color grading while your footage is still in its original camera color space, and then you use one color space transform at the very end of your node tree to change it into what you need for delivery. I'm going to drag a color space transform effect onto a node. Let's look at the settings you'll be using in the inspector. Input color space. This is where you tell Resolve the color space of the camera. To go back to that crayon metaphor, this would be what brand of crayons and how many crayons you have. In this example, this shot is from an RE Alexa and was shot using RE Wide Gamut 3. Next, we have input gamma. This tells Resolve how your camera recorded the light and dark information. Again, match this to your camera settings. For the RE camera, it was RE Log C3. Then we have output color space. This is the new box of crayons you want to change to. You want to match the format the device you're going to deliver to is expecting. In our case, we'll pick Rec. 709 since this is going to a computer monitor. Then there's output gamma. This is the new way you want the light and dark information to look. Since this is a web video, I'm going to pick gamma 2.2. If you were going to TV, you might pick 2.4. It all depends on what your deliverables are. Now these next two are super useful when you're going from a space with lots of brightness and color, like the camera space, to one with less, like a video for a website. Tone mapping helps make the bright and dark parts of your picture look good when you move from a big dynamic range where there's lots of steps between pure black and pure white to a smaller one. You've got several options. There's none. This means no changes made. If your picture is much brighter than what your output can handle, your highlights might just turn pure white and lose all their detail. Clip will just cut off any brightness or color that doesn't fit, and that can look pretty harsh. Simple is a basic way to squish the brightness into fit. Luminance mapping tries to remap the brightness in a slightly smarter way. We have DaVinci. This is a special recipe from Blackmagic Design. It's often a really good smooth starting point for making bright highlights roll off nicely, and it's the one I normally use. And finally, saturation preserving. This method tries to keep your colors from looking washed out or too intense when the brightness changes. Gamut mapping helps fit the colors from a big box of crayons into a smaller box without making them look weird or losing too many of the colorful details. With none, colors that don't fit in the new smaller box just get cut off. This can make very colorful things look flat or blocky. Saturation compression gently squeezes the most intense colors so they fit into the smaller color space, keeping them looking nice and detailed. This is the method I use. Clip is similar to tone mapping's clip. This just lops off colors that don't fit. And then we have advanced options. We have apply forward OOTF and apply inverse OOTF. OOTF stands for Opto Optical Transfer Function. Now, I'm not a color scientist, but essentially these are functions you use when you're transforming between color spaces at different sizes. 
that when you're going from a large color space, like your camera's log format, to a smaller display space, like Rec. 709, you use a forward OOTF. If you go in the opposite direction, you use an inverse OOTF. Thankfully, Resolve takes care of this automatically, as you can see it by swap these inputs and outputs around. So honestly, don't worry about it, just let Resolve figure it out. Use white point adaptation helps if the whitest white is a bit different between your input and output color spaces. It tries to make sure white still looks white. I usually keep this on. So to recap, tell Resolve exactly what your video is. This is your input color space and gamma. Tell it exactly what you want to turn it into, which is your output color space and gamma. And then use tone and gamut mapping to make that change look nice. But here's the thing to watch out for when you use this method. Grading directly in log can be tricky. Log isn't perceptually uniform, and by that I mean a small change in the control can make a big difference in some parts of the image and a small difference in others. Because of this, if you work with footage from different cameras, the tools on the color page might behave differently, especially tools that are what Resolve calls color space aware. So making a similar change in two different shots could get you very different results. It's a perfectly valid way to work, especially for quick turnarounds or if all of your footage comes from one source and it's a source you're used to working with. But let's look at a way that gives us more flexibility and often even better quality. In this first example, we were working with RE Wide Gamut 3, RE Log C3 footage. So this was our working color space that we graded in. What we're gonna do is convert the camera color space into a different working color space. We'll do all our grading in that, and then we're gonna do another conversion into a display color space. In our case, we're gonna use DaVinci Wide Gamma with DaVinci Intermediate Gamma as our working color space. But why would you want to use a special working color space? Think of DaVinci Wide Gamma as a huge box of crayons. It can hold almost any color that any current camera can see, and even colors we can't see but might see in the future. And DaVinci Intermediate is like a super flexible way to record brightness, from the deepest shadows to the brightest highlights, holding a massive amount of detail. Let's go back to the CIE scope. I'll add the gamma overlay for RE Wide Gamut 3, which is what the footage was shot in. Now I'll switch to DaVinci Wide Gamut, and it's an even bigger range. It covers everything that the RE Gamut can capture and then some. By changing into this huge color space first, we make sure we keep all of the color and brightness information that your camera captured. Your tools work more smoothly and predictably. You can push and pull the image a lot more before it starts to look bad or break. You get smoother blends, richer colors, and cleaner details. It's like painting on a giant canvas instead of a tiny one. It's also a way to future-proof your work. Let's say you grade your whole project for the web in Rec. 709, and then someone asks for a version for a cinema projector, which uses a different color space called P3. Or maybe you need a HDR version for a fancy TV. If you did all your grades in DaVinci White Gamut, DaVinci Intermediate, you can change your final color space transform to this new requirement. And aside from maybe having to make a few little tweaks, the bulk of your grade is still good because it was done in a space big enough to handle all these different outputs. So, using DaVinci Wide Gamut, DaVinci Intermediate as your workshop for color grading is a really smart move for the best quality and flexibility. So let's see how it's done. In the second method, we'll use two CST effects for each clip. Make sure you have two serial nodes. Use the shortcut Option S to add a new one if you need to. Once you do the conversions, you'll do all of your grading in between these two nodes. Node one is our input CST, where we go from our camera space to our big working space. Add the color space transform. For input color space, we go RE Wide Gamma 3, input gamma, RE Log C3, output color space, DaVinci Wide Gamma, output gamma, DaVinci Intermediate. For tone mapping, we'll say none, because we want to keep all the brightness details for grading. And we'll say none for gamma mapping too, same reason. And we'll label the node to DWG. The last node is our output CST, where we'll go from our working space to final delivery. Add another color space transform, input color space, DaVinci Wide Gamma, an input gamma, DaVinci Intermediate, output color space, Rec. 709, and output gamma, Gamma 2.2. For tone mapping, we'll use DaVinci to smoothly map the white dynamic range of DaVinci Intermediate down to Rec. 709. And for gamma mapping, saturation compression will help bring all those colors from DaVinci Wide Gamma into Rec. 709 beautifully. Let's label this to Rec. 709. And that's the two CST workflow. The first node changes camera footage to a big working color space. The last node changes from our working space to a final delivery format and then we do all our grading in between them. And since you've watched this far, I'll leave a link in the description below to a free set of pre-made CSTs that I use to speed this process up. It covers all of these common color spaces, converting them all to a working color space, and then there's a couple that go from the working color space to Rec. 709. To use them, unzip the file you downloaded, open up a power grade album, right click and select import, then select all of the DRX files and import them in. Then you can just drag them onto a node and apply them.
Okay, there's one catch with this kind of method. If you have tons of clips, doing this for every single one can take some time. And if you want to make a change, you have to make that change on every shot. And that brings us to our next method, group level color management. When you group clips together, you can apply effects to all of them at once using special pre-clip and post-clip node trees. In this example, I have a timeline with clips from two different cameras. We have some Canon C70 files and some DJI drone footage. We're gonna group our footage by camera type. First, we'll select all the Canon shots. I've already assigned them a clip color in the media pool by selecting them, right-clicking, going to clip color and picking orange. That means in the color page, I can use the drop-down menu by clips to filter them by color. Then I'll click on one thumbnail and hit Command and A to select them all. Right click on any of them and choose Add into New Group. Let's call it Canon. Now look at the top of your node tree. You should see a little drop down menu that normally has two options, Clip and Timeline. When you click it now, you have two extra options, Group Pre-Clip and Group Post-Clip. Group Pre-Clip will host our input CST for all clips in the group. This node tree happens before any individual grading you do on the clips in the group. If you downloaded my presets, you can drag the appropriate one here. Otherwise, add a color space transform to a node. Input color space will be Canon Cinema Gamut. Input Gamma will be Canon Log 2. Output color space DaVinci Wide Gamut. Output Gamma DaVinci Intermediate. Tone and gamut mapping will be set to none. Now every clip in this group automatically gets this translation to working color space node applied. We'll label this node to DWG. Now if you switch that drop down back to clip, any grading you do here in the clip node tree is happening after the pre-clip CST. So you're grading in DaVinci Wide Gamut, DaVinci Intermediate. Group Post Clip will host our output CST for all clips in the group. This node tree happens after all of the individual clip grades. Add a color space transform effect here, and we'll set it up as our output CST just like before. Input color space, DaVinci Wide Gamut. Input Gamma, DaVinci Intermediate. Output color space, Rec. 709. Output Gamma, Gamma 2.2. Tone mapping, DaVinci and gamut mapping, saturation compression. We'll label this one to Rec. 709. And just like that, all clips in the group get perfectly translated from your working space to your final delivery format. Using groups this way is a massive time saver for bigger projects. You set up your main color pipeline once in the pre-clip and post-clip node trees for each group. Then you can just focus on making each shot look great at the clip level, knowing your color science is solid. Now, if you stuck around this long, I wanna show you one more bonus trick. Right click on the node and select save a shared node. Now we'll group together our drone footage by going back to the clips filter and switching it to clip color, no clip color. We'll select them all and then add them to a new group we'll call drone. In the group pre-clip node tree, we'll set up the CST to convert it from log to DaVinci Wide Gamut, DaVinci Intermediate. Now when we go to the group post-clip node tree, instead of adding a CST to a node, right click and select add node. And at the bottom of the list, you'll see the two Rec. 709 node we created. Now you have that same node in both groups. The reason we do this is because if you need to make a new deliverable in a different color space, we just have to make the change once and it'll be reflected everywhere that node exists. Right click on it and uncheck lock node. Change the gamma from gamma 2.2 to gamma 2.4. Now we'll turn off the clip filter so we can see all our footage again. Go back to a Canon shot and in the group post clip node tree, you'll see that change has been reflected here as well. If you have lots of groups, this will be a massive time saver. Now, those of you that have been using Resolve for a little while might ask why I don't just apply that Rec. 709 node to the timeline node tree instead. The answer is because, as that name suggests, that will affect everything on my timeline. I often have graphics or logos I have to use in an edit, and I don't want the CST to affect them in any way. By using the group post clip node tree, I make sure I only apply that effect to the clips I want, instead of just blanket applying it everywhere. Now, if you're still with me, I know this was a long one, but I hope this made color management feel less scary and more like the super helpful system it actually is. If you've got any questions or you have another topic you want me to cover, leave a comment down below. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on more DaVinci Resolve tips just like this. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.